Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. My name is Anna Leeching, and I am Curator of Art at the Ulster Museum, which is part of National Museums NI in Belfast in the north of Ireland. Um, I hope you're all having a lovely evening. It's a beautiful autumnal evening here in Belfast, and I hope it's the same where you are. And thank you for um, staying inside to be part of the Zoom tonight. Um, the exhibition I curated is called Bloomsbury, a collective, and it's part of the project Cordold Connects, which has been a now five year project, I think, four or five year project um, that the Cordold has been running um, across the UK, loaning works from the Cordold collection out to public museums where um, in areas where there were actually Cordold factories. And it's been this wonderful, exciting way to um, share the Cordold collection with um, different places and different people and for people to learn more about the Cordold and also maybe learn more about their collections through that. This exhibition um, that's focused on the Bloomsbury is the third of um, the final third and third of three exhibitions that we have done. The first was a wonderful one of one of, of a Modigliani from the collection. The second um, was in 2020. It was only open for 11 days, sadly, because of COVID. Um, but we were really excited to borrow Renoir's La Loge from the collection. And then this final um, is actually um, has multiple works from the Bloomsbury collection within the Cordolf collection. And for me, I really wanted to, because it was the last exhibition um, of the project, of the Cordolf Connects project, I wanted to make it about bringing the two collections together. So bringing the Cordolf collection and the Ulster Museum public collection in one exhibition to be able to celebrate, celebrate both institutions and uh, show off what we have in our collection and also what's in the Cordold and really explore the Bloomsbury group in a new way. We are very lucky that we have um, a, some beautiful works by Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell and Roger Fry in the Ulster Museum collection, but we never really get to show them in the context of the Bloomsbury group. And here in the North of Ireland, people wouldn't really be as aware of Bloomsbury as maybe a lot of you people listening and watching tonight are maybe from the South of England. So it was really a chance to show and tell the story of Bloomsbury in this context of a collective and how these artists work together at the um, at the sort of start of the 20th century and explore their politics, explore their pacifism and explore really the, this idea of the collective and um, obviously then looking at the Omega group, which is our focus for this evening. So I'm just going to show you very briefly um, just some photographs of the exhibition so that you can see what it looks like if anybody who is not in Ireland. Um, and you can just see there, really, it is a very small show, um, but we are um, delighted to be able to share these works and have a very in-focused depth, in-depth look at um, the Bloomsbury group. And then just on the right-hand side there, you can see examples of Omega, which is really what we're here to talk about this evening. Um, and in the chat, whenever I hand over to our first speaker, I will put in information about the exhibition if you want to come and see it. It's on until the 16th of October. And I'll also um, put in a link to the actual interpretation for the show so you can read a bit about what the, the exhibition explores and, and those themes I've talked about if you're interested. But if you're in Ireland or you visit in Ireland, please um, feel free to come and have explore the exhibition um, for yourself. So the format of this evening is that we're going to have um, three speakers and I'm going to introduce each speaker before they talk and tell you a little bit about them and then hand over to them. And then at the end of that, we're going to have about 10, 15 minutes for um, questions from yourselves. So please feel free to put them in the chat throughout um, the evening and I'll be gathering those and pulling some together um, for us at the end. Um, and so now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, if my computer will let me get um, her bio up. And our first speaker this evening is from the Cordal. So we're gonna start by talking about the Cordal collection and then kind of go further and expand and then end with a present day maker and artist, which is really exciting. Um, and our first speaker is Sasha Gerstein, Gerstein who's um, the McQueen's Curator of Sculpture and Decorative Arts at the Cordal in London. She is responsible um, for the collection of sculpture and decorative arts, which counts for over 500 objects spanning a wide geography and a variety of media and technique, dating from the medieval period to the early 20th century, which is our focus this evening. She is also the lead curator for Providence research with respect to the Nazi period and for restitution claims. 
Since 2010, she has overseen a wonderful program of research and conservation of the areas of strengths within the collection that she looks after, which has led to multiple publications and exhibitions and has really raised the profile of this less well-known part of the Cordold collection. This has included a catalogue on the medieval and later ivories in the Cordold Gallery, um, and this was followed by uh, one on the Renaissance and later works, or later ceramic works, I think it was. And um, then the next cataloguing project will focus on the Cordold Gallery's collection of Islamic metalwork, which is really fascinating. But prior to the gallery's closure for refurbishment, Sasha curated the exhibition Beyond Bloomsbury, Designs of the Omega Workshops, 1913 to 1919. And um, she is going to share her research from that exhibition with us this evening. I'll hand over to you, Sasha. Thank you. Hello, and thank you, Anna, for that introduction. So I will speak for um, just a, a, an introductory um, period, just on the Bloomsbury Collective and the approach to design and um, and furnishings uh, of the Omega workshops, which at the time didn't really have any parallel anywhere. Um, there were workshops in, in Europe, in Austria, in, in France, in Paris. There was um, avant-garde design. Um, there was to be the Bauhaus, but it, it didn't exist yet. And there was in, in um, Great Britain, there was an approach to creating arts for the house or, or crafts, um, which was very much uh, derived from William Morris and thinking about creating beautiful objects with beautiful materials and very um, extensive uh, and, and uh, applied um, expertise in making and skills. What the Omega workshops was, was something completely different. It was an approach led by artists. Um, and in this image, you in this photograph of about 1913, you see Roger Fry, who was the, the, the sort of brains behind the Omega workshops. He was a curator, a connoisseur, a critic, a writer, a, um, a, a, a protagonist of, of modernism. Um, who brought um, that uh, to, to Britain. He had fantastic links with France, um, but he also was an artist and he, um, but mainly was friends of artists and he understood the great challenges that artists, uh, young artists around him had to produce work, you know, without the sort of state behind them. And he thought um, to, that if they, if he could create with a, a group of like-minded artists who were, as Anna says, like, him in in their in his in their politics in their social um, philosophical outlook of, on life sexual politics I mean if a group of artists who who had the same feeling and also the same ideas about modern art could get together and create things for the home and environments for the home then they could do something really new and really modern and so it's with that approach that I thought I would show you some images of works some of which are works in the Courtauld's collection uh, many are not. But um, it, just to show you the, the kind of breadth of design that they undertook, but also, and probably more importantly, the, the, the ethos behind it. The ethos was one of sharing, one of combined work, uh, one of um, kind of an egalitarian view, which wasn't always translated into how they actually worked in, in the workshops, but basically all the artists would together produce um, as a kind of, in, in a kind of house style, they would produce, I mean, each one had their individual style, but they didn't sign individually the pieces. They, they signed each piece with the, um, the Greek letter Omega, which was the, the name of, of, the, of this enterprise itself. So here you have Roger Fry in the center, designing on a, on a kind of trestle table and behind him, some of the women who uh, were running the, the workshops and who also um, assisted a lot of the work. And here it is in Bloomsbury in um, Fitzroy Square. I'm gonna go quite quickly through the pictures. I just want to give you a flavor really of the um, um, ambiance of the environment. You can see uh, Omega Workshops Limited written um, here uh, inscribed on the facade with some um, murals made at the time, which unfortunately are no longer there. Here is the interiors is what struck uh, right, uh, journalists and, and, and the few clients and the many avant-garde clients who came in as just completely 
well, sort of out of this world and, and, and immersive, an, inver an immersive environment that included painted, uh, painted screens, painted walls, uh, stenciled walls, painted uh, fabrics and textiles, painted furniture, painted objects, printed furniture, uh, printed textiles, really anything that the artists could put their hand to. And here's a, a kind of slightly tongue in cheek, but, but true. <laughs> um, um, uh, article spread, uh, newspaper spread on the women who do the most original war work of all. Uh, so the women of the Omega workshops. And here they are showing the kinds of wares that um, that that uh, they produced. And um, it's, it's all very staged, obviously. It is notable that there are a lot of women. So I haven't told you who, uh, apart from Roger Fry, was behind the Omega workshops. There was Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell. And the three of them formed the kind of um, the, well, from the directors, and everyone else came in and was and worked and was paid for a half day or a day. They weren't paid per design; they were paid sort of for the time. It was a, a very, it was meant to be a very egalitarian and 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 sort of beneficial system for the artists to give them some, um, um, you know, some sort of salary. And here are um, I've shown. I'm going to show you some objects, some examples of printed textiles that uh, you can see in the black and white photo. The textiles are unlike, again, unlike anything really that was produced, either very geometrical, such as this one, which is kind of half finished. They were uh, probably, well, they, they were printed, we know that, and they were probably printed in France. Um, and then they were um, um, distributed in, in England, in London. And we can surmise who designed, which pieces, so we believe that on the left with this very fluid, fluid line was Duncan Grant, on the right was Roger Fry. Um, I like them together because they all have names of women. Uh, it's slightly mysterious, some are, are less mysterious than others, but this one to the right was designed by Fry and the left carries the name of his daughter called Pamela. This one on the left is Maud, um, again after someone in their circle and, um, and white. We think after a, a suffragette, but we're not entirely certain. Um, and they are very loose, and that's what they loved. That they they it was very uh, the 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 ethos was that the artist's uh, gesture and the artist's kind of first thought and the artist's um, freedom was to be treasured and was to be celebrated, not perfection. And it was um, a kind of cry against the machine and the perfect. The, the 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 perfect industrial product, and yet, as I said, it's di it was different from the arts and crafts sort of perfection, because um, in a way, you it, it was almost better that there weren't that they weren't experts. That was kind of um, part of the deal that they, that these things were produced by were designed by the artists. And what was interesting is that sometimes they were designed by the artists, and such as these textiles made outside. Sometimes they were designed by the artists and painted by the artists. Other times they were designed by the artists and painted by some of the assistants, most of whom are women, young women, who had you know, art, art, art training but weren't well known. Um, but the design always happened in, in, the, in the workshops. And what was interesting, and I show you this here because here's a dress um, worn by um, the artist Nina Hamnett in a, in a painting by Roger Fry. And she also worked at the, at the, at the Omega workshops. And here's a printed uh, pillowcase. Or, um, uh, in this printed textile called mod. And what is really interesting is the versatility. And that is something I do find very modern and it's sort of one of the legacies of the Omega workshops. Here is a, um, a painted silk. So of the kind you saw in, in, in the, the sort of thing you saw in that photograph I showed you of the, the newspaper article. And this was printed probably with the expertise of someone having come in and shown them how to um, do some sort of resist dyeing or printing. Uh, sorry, a painting on silk uh, to make sure it stayed. But otherwise, um, and these are these are similar examples of small um, portable or wearable uh, pieces that are painted, but using certain techniques that um, ensured that they they were um, they they stayed uh, fixed. But what they uh, what the Omega workshops really enjoyed was the idea that they that they, they were artists first and 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 not expert craftswomen and men. The 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 um, textiles they produced were also used uh, in here in a um, 
in a play, Twelfth Night, which is produced by uh, one of the leading um, avant-garde uh, directors in, in Paris called Jacques Copeau. And this is the very beginning. And you see the textile um, here the, is, is, is the mod textile mixed with a bit of the um, Pamela. This is an interior, an interior uh, showcasing an ideal nursery. Uh, this, there's a, this was designed, um, we think, by, by, by Vanessa Bell and painted with uh, the woman who really ran the Omega workshops, a young woman called Winifred Gill, about whom I believe we'll hear a, a bit more um, later in the talk on pacifism. Here you have painted furniture, you have painted animals. Animals is a big theme. Um, there's a, an idea of there's textiles, the mechtil textile under the counter in the, in the curtains. And the whole notion that this could be a nursery when we know that at the time nurseries were very regulated um, places for children in the homes of the middle classes and upper middle classes. And here is something kind of quite free with even um, painting sort of cutouts uh, on the ceilings. Uh, this is the kind of painted furniture that uh, one, one sees examples of in that photo. Uh, this is in fact based on a lily pond design. It's a, it's a tabletop of a table that was painted in the Omega workshops, but the table itself was made outside by outside source. And here is a screen with the same motif. Um, the screen incidentally can be seen in the Courtauld Gallery in London in our Bloomsbury room. And I thought you might be interested to see the design from which it derives, which is much more recognizably that of a lily pond. Uh, it was a lily pond on the property of Roger Fry. Animals, again, you have a geometrical, slightly cubistic kind of um, uh, giraffe. And you can see the process from design to, to um, a, a very uh, refined bit of marketry work. So. As you can imagine, they didn't have the skills to make that piece of furniture, and that was outsourced to um, someone nearby in Bloomsbury called Callenborn. But something like a tray that was painted, well, it starts off as a design, as in here, um, and is painted. Um, well, it's probably not being painted at the time when this photograph was taken, but you can see, incidentally, Nina Hamlet, the artist, and, and someone else painting or showing this. So they had the, they had a, a variety, a breadth of um, surfaces upon which they can just um, apply their motifs sort of willy-nilly. And that, as I said, I think is, a, is, a, is one of the legacies of the Omega Workshop's design ethos, which is to just not be restrictive. Here is a really charming uh, design of a, of a fish and a, a man hugging a fish. And you can, you can see it repeated in, an, in numerous places um, on rugs. And then here is a little box, painted box. Another animal here. Um, this was, in fact, uh, we think made for. Well, it was made, designed, and used, or made for um, an embroidered pillowcase. And then there's the completely abstract, and that's something that um, I will end with. This sort of abstraction in design. The designs for rugs are one of their great specialties, and this is something that has been very much um, appreciated, and probably. And at the time as well, um, clients could come in and look at a portfolio of designs. I'm not entirely certain this is for a rug. It may be for a fire screen, but this certainly is for a rug. And they could look at a portfolio of designs and choose, um, or they could also commission. And so this was a commission of a, a rug of which there are five of these rugs. This one is at the Victorian Albert Museum in London, but originally there were five of them and they were made for, um, a very uh, upscale uh, house in, in London. I will end with um, ceramics, despite that this is a poster for uh, dresses, but I like the, the sort of vase shaped or the mix of vase and um, mannequin shape. They did um, also have dresses and a dressmaking department that they brought in a, a dressmaker from, from Paris. Um, well, but before I get to the ceramics, I'll show you a few more examples of, of um, outfits and dresses. The versatility I spoke with is evident here. You have a fairly glum looking Vanessa Bell and she's wearing a dress. And the um, textile itself seems to be, the fabric seems to be 
this design, which is a block printed, and you can sort of see the outline of the blocks. It's a block printed um, design, which in fact was more commonly used at the Omega workshops for, for um, covering books. And here's another one. But just shows you how they didn't didn't um, feel that it was it was awkward or 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 wrong as as um, certainly the previous generation and then the later generation of Bauhaus designers would have felt that to apply one design onto another it, it wasn't about that it was about creating an artistic environment. Here you have uh, two photos that I find really uh, um, sort of say it all of uh, Winifred Gill, um, the young woman who was brought in, uh, she was like Roger Fry, a Quaker, and she was brought in um, to run uh, the, the workshops to sort of manage it. So here you have, I think, a very Victorian photo of her as a young woman, and then a, a sort of more, well, carefree and, and post Omega kind of a photo of her with some uh, marionettes. Hats, they did design hats. Winifred Guild talks about, you know, madly crocheting a hat for sale. Here you have a, a um, we have a, um, portrait of the Bloomsbury, um, friend of the Bloomsbury, uh, the economist John Maynard Keynes, and some hats that hats that were may or may not have been made, um, but were designed. And then the ceramics, I, I promised you that um, are another striking and important legacy of this very short lived, but um, wow, so uh, dynamic and, and kind of punchy uh, expression of early, early 20th century modernism. And these are black and white ceramics from produced by, in fact, Roger Fry um, at, um, at a pottery manufacturers in uh, Dorset called Carter's. And he, he made them, he made them through the war. And he um, liked the austerity, I think, of these shapes. He also wasn't always extreme. He, he learned quickly, he wasn't an extremely skilled potter. And I think there's a, a very sort of charming and typical mix of kind of where the technique, the limits of the technique meet also his aspirations for something very simple. Um, I think I will, I will end it there just to say that the Omega workshops did close in 1919 and it was an aesthetic success insofar as it sort of left traces within the avant-garde and within 20th century British art. It was not a financial success and um, it didn't necessarily change the way um, artistic wares were made, but it certainly lives in the in, in the sort of um, history of early 20th century modernist experiments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. That was um, really insightful and just beautiful to see all those examples as well. And I just love with that painting with the with the the cushion with the mod fabric is just lovely because it just shows how all the outputs of Bloomsbury and Omega kind of penetrated every aspect of of their practice because even in the exhibition we have a painting by Vanessa Bell that has a ginger jar and in that that ginger jar is used in a print an Omega print by Grant in the wood engraving book and it's just how yeah it just kind of infiltrated every aspect of their life and it's lovely to see that and that they also had a legacy with that as well. Yes it's a sort of immersive environment that then where objects and imaginings of objects and visions of objects are sort of in conversation. Mm -hmm. No it's lovely it's lovely to see that in, in a painting and um, so thank you so much and obviously we'll have time um, to ask Sasha some questions at the end so please if you have anything in your mind right now you want to ask her please feel free to put it in the chat and I'll um, get back to that at the end. So now we'll um, get on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Grace Brockington, um, who is Senior Lecturer in History of Art at the University of Bristol. She is a specialist in modern British art with particular interest in the connections between art, literature, internationalism um, and theatre. She was guest curator for the exhibition Godier Breska, um, Disputing the Earth, and which was in Bristol in 2019 and collaborated with Impermanence Dance Theatre and the Paul Mellon Centre to create a film and virtual exhibition centred on experimental theatre in London in the First World War. Her interest in the Omega workshops began with a project about the peace movement and in the early 20th century and its impact on the arts in Britain. This was published as Above the Battlefield, Modernism and the Peace Movement in Britain 1900 to 1918. 
And this has led to projects about war and puppetry, the artist Vanessa Bell and book illustration. And her talk this evening will talk will touch on some of these ideas um, that was raised from that from that huge research project. So I'll just hand over to you, Grace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'll just share my presentation a moment. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the particular historical moment in which the Omega was operating and the impact it had on what they did and what the Omega was about. Um, so the recent pandemic has been difficult for all of us, including for artists and performers whose networks and livelihoods were completely shut, shut off during lockdown. I start with this point because it gives us a way of relating to the experience of artists at the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, when the art world was subject to a similar, similar collapse. Markets disappeared, exhibitions were cancelled, groups dispersed, and critics turned nasty and reactionary. Many projects which were started in 1913-1914 with high hopes and the expectation of a new renaissance in European culture disappeared from sight. Um, the Bloomsbury artist Vanessa Bell, who I know features in um, your exhibition, um, had this to say about it. She said that the excitement and the joy had gone. The hostility of the general public was real now, no longer a ridiculous and even stimulating joke. The Omega workshops was one of these projects, I mean, one of these projects which was in danger of disappearing. When it opened in July 1913, it was a child of post-impressionism, the new art from France that promised to transform culture and society. The outbreak of war thwarted those ambitions. And it's easy to take the view that, from <clears throat> that that was the beginning of the end for the Omega. From that point, it began to fail. It was particularly difficult for Roger Fry and his friends to carry on as artists, because so many of them were in fact pacifists. Their objections to the war and their refusal to join up left them socially isolated and open to public disapproval. <clears throat> there was simply no chance of establishing a wider market for Omega wares when they were designed and made by conscientious objectors and pacifist sympathisers. Given all this, it's extraordinary that the Omega carried on for as long as it did. It lasted, in fact, until 1919, closing within 12 months of the end of the war. What seems to have happened is that the war changed the nature of the Omega, giving it a new and different sense of purpose rather than simply undermining its purpose. So when the war ended, Fry chose to close it rather than reinventing it all over again. The wartime Omega was remarkable because it became, became a centre for pacifists of a particular type. People like Roger Fry and his Bloomsbury friends who saw the First World War as a threat to European civilization and were concerned at the way the wartime government set about undermining civil liberties in their attempt to shore up the war effort. Fry responded by making the Omega a sharp front for the British peace movement. He employed conscientious objectives, contributed to Quaker relief work in France, published books and organized a social club. He and his friends continued to make the sort of experimental art they believed in. This in itself was a kind of cultural resistance at a time when many artists had returned to a more conservative practice. And they even made objects which expressed their pacifist views more or less directly. I'm going to look now at a selection of objects which help us to recover that world of cultural resistance to the war. So starting with this photograph of Winifred Grill, Gill, who Sasha's thought he told us a certain am a amount about, an artist herself, but also the woman who managed the Omega during the war. Um, this photo was taken shortly after the war in about 1920, and it shows her posing with one of the many puppets which she made. Um, and I show it here because it gives us a way into the social world of the Omega. When Virginia Woolf wrote her biography of Roger Fry, she noted that, and I quote, um, in spite of air raids and frosts, the Omega must be made to form a center. And there's a nice little sort of touch of bathos around the idea of air raids and frosts being equally problematic to the Omega. But, um, you know, either you're too cold or you're, um, or you have a bomb dropped on you and they both seem to be work equally in, in, in Woolf's sentence. But, um, for Fry, um, it was an opportunity to turn 
um, you know, get into a centre for free speech and debate by setting up a social club, which ran in the evenings after the artists had stopped work. These events were very popular and attended by men of letters like W.B. Yeats, George Bernard Shaw and Bertrand Russell. They sat on sacks stuffed with straw instead of chairs. They listened to music recitals in aged Belgian refugees. And they watched amateur puppet shows with puppets made by the Omega artists, which is where this photo of Gil comes into play. Here, moving on to my next slide, is um, a set of designs that she made for dolls with jointed limbs, which are very like the marionettes that she and other artists made for the Omega. And you'll notice here the odd military figure amongst the dancers and the musicians. So on the top row is Admiral Jellicoe, who commanded the fleet in 1916 and 1917. And on the bottom, there's this sort of rotund military figure who's weighed down by medals, which I suspect he didn't turn. Um, one of the Omega plays which featured puppets by Gill was a pacifist allegory written by Goldsworthy Lois Dickinson, who was a Cambridge Don who campaigned for the creation of a League of Nations to prevent a future conflict. He was one of the very first people to start thinking about um, the, the mechanics of, of the League of Nations, how it might work, how it could be constituted. Um, and it's a nice touch that this page from the script of that play, which he called War and Peace, is actually written on Omega-headed writing paper. The Omega also became a center for the written word. Fry stopped copies of foreign language journals, which were otherwise difficult to get hold of. And he published a series of books under the Omega name. This was a risky thing to do during the war because of censorship, the lack of market interest and the practical problem of sourcing paper and other materials. But Fry believed that it was, as he said, and I quote here, as necessary as ever to keep certain things going. One of the books that he published during the war relates explicitly to the peace movement. It was Men of Europe, which um, I'm showing you here, two pages from the book, one in colour, one in not, one not in colour rather. Um, but it was a translation of a collection of poems by the French pacifist Pierre Jean Juve. Fry published it in 1916 with Juve's blessing. And when Juve wrote to Fry about it, he said that he saw it as a gesture of solidarity with English pacifists, and he offered it to them as a work of pacifist propaganda. And the account of war that it offers the reader is indeed graphic. We read of a dead soldier with his eyes, I'm quoting here, his eyes consumed by worms and his body, and I'm going to quote, caught in the mud of pain. The woodcut illustrations, the illuminated um, letters which we see on these pages, were by a Norwegian artist called um, Roald Christian. He actually, his, his birth name was Edgar de Bergen, but during the war he changed it to Roald Christian because he sounded, thought that sounded less German. Um, but um, Christian um, worked at the Omega, um, and here he uses this sort of um, red ink um, illumination, this sort of blood red colour on the on the letterhead, and a, a pattern of crossed and jagged lines, which I think suggests something of the experience of trench warfare, of um, barbed wire perhaps, or the hard lines of aerial bombardment. Um, when Fry wrote about the Omega, his tone was often despondent. Um, so he said things like, um, I expect my Omega will flounder in this world cataclysm, and or it seems a small thing amid such general disaster. Or a year later, he's writing to Vanessa Bell and he says, we don't yet know whether the Omega will survive. I should like to kill it personally, but I don't think it would be right to do so. Um, I think it's that sense of moral imperative that makes the Omega so important as a pacifist project during the war. It made a bold public statement of Fry's values as a pacifist, who believed that art was international and that civilization was antithetical to war. On a practical and economic level, it was extraordinarily difficult to keep the Omega going during the war. So the political incentive must have been overwhelming. When the Omega eventually closed in 1919, it wasn't a sign of failure, so much as an acknowledgement that it had done its job. 
with the coming of peace, it was time to move on. Thank you. There, um, back to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Grace, that was fascinating. It's actually for me as well, because through this kind of journey with this exhibition, I've been thinking so much about the collective and this kind of communal aspect to Bloomsbury and Omega, but haven't really thought about that idea of how isolated it isolated they were from the rest of society obviously talking about passivism but thinking about that as something that connected them but of course it's something that disconnected them with with outer society at that time so it's, it's important to think about that as well so so thank you for for that yep my pleasure thanks and definitely if anybody has any questions for grace please throw them in the chat um and you know keep thinking about it um, for the rest of the talk. I noticed a few people mentioning actually they came late to the talk and maybe missed the start. Um, tonight is actually recorded. Um, one of the few benefits of what lockdown has done for us is that we can keep these events forever. Um, so um, that will be shared by the research forum whenever that's available online. So if you missed any or you want to go back over anything, you can um, after tonight's event. So now I'm going to um, hand over to our third and final speaker and it's really exciting and I love people to, to do this with events is bringing everything back to kind of the present and current artistic practice. And tonight we have Alia Hussein, who is a visual artist and contemporary jewellery designer based in Todmorden in West Yorkshire. She makes abstract, playful, sculptural work for the body that incorporates techniques and processes typically found in traditional ceramics. The jewellery she makes is informed by her visual arts practice, and there is often a crossover um, of ideas between her sculptures and printmaking. She works in collaboration with museums and galleries to create bespoke jewellery collections based on specific artworks or collections, including the Courtauld, um, Tate, Hepworth, Wakefield and the Dulwich Picture Gallery. And I'll just hand over to you now, Alia. Thank you very much. So hi, and thank you for the introduction and for the invites this evening's event. It's a real treat to have been able to hear um, all this amazing information about the Omega workshops um, and also really honoured to be able to chat to you a bit about um, how the Omega workshops have influenced my jewellery collection that I made for the portal. <clears throat> so, as mentioned, I'm a visual artist and contemporary jewellery designer based in Todmorden, in West Yorkshire. Before this, I was based in a kind of artist studios Sort of collective space called Islington Mill in Salford for 12 years. Um, I make abstract playful sculptural work for the body with a focus on line, form and colour. I'm going to scroll through some images of my jewellery work as I sort of introduce my practice in more detail. Um, I'm a bit of a sort of shape shifter as an artist. Um, so I started my jewellery business in 2016 as a way to support myself and my arts practice and also find a way to bring in some of my interest in costume design and wearable art. So from 2010 to 2014, I was co-founder of an experimental performance collective where we built sets, costumes and collaborated with musicians and dancers to create these kind of very immersive performance pieces. <laughs> So similarly to the Omega workshops in some ways, um, at the same time I started making jewellery, um, I also helped form a new collective of 12 artists and designers where we all shared a large um, studio slash house. It was an old engine house that was part of a textile mill in Salford. Um, so we set up our studio so that we had a workshop downstairs. We pulled together all of our equipment and resources and swap skills and worked on collaborative projects. So the jewellery for me started in kind of a small way as something playful and experimental when I needed a break from thinking or planning. Um, it was first sold in fairly informal open studio settings and then I began to take it more seriously as people became interested in it and then I started developing collections as well as collaborating and stocking with art galleries, shops and museums. So making jewellery now forms an essential part of my working practice as an artist. Um, I use it as a way to kind of continuously refine and work on my practical craft skills. Um, the work's also stocked um, sort of in galleries and shops across the UK, so that kind of keeps me busy sort of 
working on the kind of detail of things. Um, so even within my jewelry practice, the work I make is quite broad and it's quite varied. Um, I try to keep things as interesting as possible by collaborating where I can. So this is usually with a gallery um, where I'll respond to pieces in their collection uh, to create something bespoke. So we'd usually start with a conversation and then create a mood board of work that I've made in the past um, and then combine that with some images from their collections and then I'll work on creating something new. So in both my jewellery and sculptural practice, I work with various clay bodies, including stoneware, hand-dyed porcelain and polymer clay. My work incorporates techniques and processes typically found in traditional ceramics, um, but I tend to focus my work on either using coils or um, a Japanese technique called narukomi, or the English version is agate wear. Um, pattern, surface and decoration are a really key part of my work and I'm fascinated by all the different glaze options and their colours and textures and the way they sit together and overlap. So I'll often hand paint, um, I'll often hand paint sort of very detailed textures onto the surfaces of my work or um, I could also make use of the kind of elasticity of polymer clay to create sort of very intricately detailed canes that are filled with patterns. So there's a lot of overlap kind of both ways where the sort of edges of what I'm making, whether jewellery or sculpture, drawing, collage and printmaking sort of become blurry and, and sit together. Okay, so I'm going to show you now some of the specific pieces from the Omega Workshop artworks that inspired my collection for the Courtauld and talk a bit about why I was drawn to them. Um, and just to mention, because this commission was for the Courtauld shop, I specifically focused my research um, and inspiration on items that are held in the Courtauld collection. Okay. So first up is my favourite, which is the, uh, it's just called Design with Confronted Peacocks. Um, I was immediately drawn to this design because of its very bold abstraction that I found had similarities to some of my abstract print and collage work. I also love the use of colours. Um, colour is such a presence in my work and I try to make use of, of all of the colours. Um, I try not to stick to sort of tried and tested palettes and I try to make my decisions maybe more as an artist rather than strictly as a designer, which is something I believe is similar to how the artists in the Omega workshops work too. So they were working as painters whilst they were creating these textile designs. So that kind of, again, overlap of art and design. I also really liked how many times this design had been worked out by the artist or artists. Um, this work is attributed to Roger Fry, but from what I've read in a book called uh, Beyond Bloomsbury Designs of the Omega Workshops, 1913 to 19, uh, lots of the work was created anonymously and collaboratively. So it sounds more than possible that many artists and assistants might have worked on their own versions of this design. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed the repetition of it, um, the refinement or just the kind of working out and um, again, finding similarities to my own work um, while we turn to a form maybe over and over again, just to kind of still find something to understand. Um, I also felt like it was important to incorporate this design because um, it also featured on a wearable object. So it was hand painted onto silk and was made into a stole or a, like a shawl. Um, and in the book it says, it is thought that the stole remained unsold and that after the closure of the workshop in 1919, Fry gave it as a wedding present to Joy Brown, the dressmaker who for a time worked at both Hampshire House and the Omega, which I think is quite funny in the way that now it feels like such a striking uh, representation of this, the activity from the workshop. Um, and it's also the front cover of the book that I mentioned. So I think maybe just it was a little ahead of its time. Um, so here you can see the interpretation of 
uh, my interpretation of the design. So the method I use is one um, in this one is the Japanese ceramic technique called Narukomi, where layers of dyed clay are arranged into a pattern, um, into a block, and then sliced. So there's also similarities to this technique found in glass making and also in boiled sweets. So think like Blackpool or Brighton Rock, depending on where you're based. Uh, so if you think of like long, malleable canes of hot glass or sugar, or wet coils if it's clay, uh, are arranged together and then fused and stretched. And this means that really detailed patterns can be achieved at a small scale, but either you haven't actually had to work in miniature. Each slice that you slice along this cane is also unique due to the way that the patterns shift um, inside the cane as it's stretched or it's possibly slightly twisted, which I think is also really nice linked to how many versions of the peacock designs were created. Uh, so here's just an example of how this cane process works, just a kind of visualization for you. So this is just a few of the canes that were maybe cut ahead of time and then use those to build bigger images. And then this is just a really, just a version of how the scale of how you would work to then what you end up with. So now that I explain my work in more detail and a bit about my thought processes and methods. I'm going to share some more of the individual artworks, um, objects and patterns I was inspired by, as well as images from the final collection, which was released in autumn 2021 and consists of three pairs of earrings, a necklace and a bracelet. So I wanted the overall collection to have some of the feeling of everything all at once. So that kind of overload of patterns that feature in the work from the Omega workshops and from the feeling of being um, at Charlton House. So plenty of color, uh, working with a kind of more muted or like muddier tones, maybe imagining paint swirled on a palette um, rather than very defined kind of bold colors and trying to incorporate um, as much variation in pattern as I can fit in one small collection. So thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to see any more of my work, you can visit the Corpo shop or head to my online shop or follow me on Instagram. Thank you so much, Alia, for that wonderful exploration of your work. I think it just shows you just how easily those kind of patterns and designs of Omega translate into your modern work to show us how kind of ahead of their time they were and Absolutely. just and especially just that maybe people just didn't there, there is maybe a thought behind maybe Omega not lasting longer that people maybe just didn't get it mm -hmm. <laughs> because for us we look at that now and it's just like these beautiful patterns and something that was so obviously be very popular um, so because it's absolutely stunning and definitely from the from your pieces you get that sense of yeah that kind of everything all at once of Charleston which is mm -hmm. a very space to be in which is so it's lovely to be able to sort of see that in this kind of miniature way for sure thank you um, yep. oh sorry you're gonna say something uh no i was just gonna say yeah i feel like the works are just so they feel very contemporary mm -hmm. and Definitely. yeah i maybe at the time they did not well they were too contemporary maybe <laughs> too contemporary, yeah um just whilst everyone's there's a couple of questions here but it just wanted to maybe anyone's trying to think of some more questions actually i have a question for you and then and um, we can put it out to everyone else. But I guess if everybody wants to kind of come back, turn their, um, if uh, Grace and Sasha want to turn their cameras back on and their mics just for question time. Um, but in the meantime, actually, Ali, I've got a wee question for you, just thinking of you talking about your own work. Mm -hmm. And obviously you're very comfortable and experienced with working as a collective and that kind of collaboration. But through your research of Omega, did that change your thoughts around it or did it tie in with the way you would work collectively or kind of make you think about new ways of doing things or? I think, so I wasn't really that aware of 
Omega workshop before mm. this project and actually I was a bit I was kind of like maybe I was one of them in a past life because it <laughs> felt so similar to the way that um we worked in this space in in Salford in Islington Mill and I think in some, some slightly connected not not as extreme as what they were going through but I graduated straight into the 2008 recession and we were I was part of very lucky to be part of this kind of artist collective formal informal you know we set up our own things it was very fluid but the way that we thought about things and did things was maybe had it, it just felt like a similar sort of spirit to what they were doing but I wasn't aware of it it just felt yeah it was quite amazing to read about it and go wow we just we just did what is similar to what they did yeah so yeah I find it I'm like really interested in what they say and now I'm way more interested in their politics as well because that feels yeah. super relevant to right now as well it definitely does and I think I'm the same because it wouldn't be my normal area and then for this exhibition spent a lot of time at but I specialize in artists as activists and it was like yeah. oh here's this kind of very quiet form of activism that I wasn't really aware of and um no it's wonderful to think that I think a lot of people now obviously with collectives have become you know quite big in the news in the last few years and I think it's it's wonderful to sort of see that there this is an historic thing that's gone on for Absolutely. a long time so and it's such an important way of working so no it's great and that's lovely just yeah to, to hear that yeah you feel like you were them in a the past life <laughs> <laughs> living in Charleston um <laughs> just um I guess um another question I will have you for me for you um Grace and Sasha is just obviously the Omega group was very short-lived and you know Grace you made a lovely point about maybe when you know it wasn't this idea of failure it was this idea of kind of it had come to its natural end and sort of done its job but do you think if it hadn't have been for you know if they'd have done that maybe at a different time or if the war hadn't had the impact that it had of kind of making them maybe more isolated or or not, you know, people weren't buying the way people would be buying it maybe in that interwar period. Do you think it could have gone on longer, maybe had more kind of commercial success? Or do you think that's just, you know, moot and commercial success isn't something that matters? I mean, who knows? I I think that you know, just before the war started, the phase that Kept, keeps coming up and again and again in literature is just the expression new renaissance mm. which people thought it was sort of just about to get going that things were really taking off um and if they were right then it could have become something extraordinary um you know it could really have been successful um i don't see why not really um there's a sense of everything just being sort of squashed on the head with the outbreak of the war mm -hmm. Um, and then it sort of picks up again afterwards that um, for some reason people still weren't buying Omega. Um, maybe, and, and I just wonder if it had become tainted in some way by its associations with the peace movement that that mm. sort of shadow never quite, it couldn't quite shake, they couldn't quite shake it off. Mm. And also the, the, the kind of clientele for the Omega workshops in a way was maybe restricted by the fact that the works sort of had to they couldn't be sold cheap um and yet you know did they really do their market research who was their clientele were those who had the money or the pocketbook those who would naturally buy their products or were they actually the more bohemian or were they those which is what people often say about the omega workshops it was actually just a tiny slice of that overlap between the moneyed and the bohemian and the because you know, you think of the, um, I mean, it's not really maybe a, entirely a parallel, but the um, gradual acceptance or the acceptance of, of, of modern uh, French art or modern art at the time. And sort of, you know, that takes, that takes time. It's not happening in these years. Mm -hmm. um, and this is another proposition. It's sort of to live with these, with an environment or to be dressed, you know, if, in, in clothes that don't, um, th that uh, either they were slightly old-fashioned in terms of clothes, in terms of dresses, a bit like the the um, that dress that we saw in the photograph of Vanessa Bell, mm -hmm. or they were just so radical they weren't really like clothes at all. They were more like kind of moving pictures. Mm -hmm. Who would, who would, yeah, subscribe to that? Wearing pieces of art. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, they really wanted to change things, didn't they? It wasn't just um, about art on the walls and it wasn't just about, um, you know, buying nice clothes. It was about selling a complete way of life. Mm -hmm. which, it was, I think it was about ideas as much as it was about objects. Mm -hmm. you, you bought the clothes because you bought into the ideas. Um, yeah. And so it's you, quite interesting because who, who was the sort of, yeah, who would have really gone with that, I suppose? Other than those who went in and maybe for a laugh bought a small thing or for a, or you know a small box or yeah, it was the members of the collective themselves itself who were the people who were the clientele, which is a strange mm -hmm. sort of kind of self feeding thing as well. But actually, um, we just got a comment there from Kat in the chat, sort of saying perhaps they wouldn't have been as experimental with the materials they used if the war hadn't happened, and that's an interesting, you know, you know, because obviously maybe that did affect. The way they looked at things and this idea of kind of being a bit more radical i don't know i'm not sure about that because i think that um no i think i think really roger fry had i mean sort of admirable enthusiasm for the whole project as grace says not only a project of you know making mm -hmm. some you know things to put on the walls or, or, or painting the walls but really an ethos behind it all which was mm -hmm. um yeah, make, mixing, sort of not being restrained, you know, by or constrained by convention at all. I think you're not being constrained at all. I just, you know, the, the idea of, of a sort of any surface is good for any kind of design is, is pretty radical, I think, would have been. Definitely, because I think, well, also in 1913, obviously that was pre-war, but he, it was a definite just considered ethos that he wrote about and he, you know, he had a plan. and. Um, definitely i think it's something everybody needs to remember about bloomsbury or the group of people in omega as well you know they were coming they were sort of they were coming up on an age at the end of the victorian era and sort of saw this victorian era as being very stifling and very ordered in a way that they didn't want to be part of anymore so i think yeah i think you're right this would have happened anyway and maybe would have happened in a bigger scale but maybe because they, they're still would have they were still fighting against things in society they didn't agree with whether it was the First World War or the other other politics that were centrist at the time. <laughs> but I think also, you know, just touching on a point, Grace, that you said, you know, even though maybe it wasn't as supported at the time, it's still clearly very special because we're still talking about it now. There's still this hunger for Omega and this hunger for Bloomsbury. And actually um, a question that we've had from, from a few, you two sort of Bloomsbury and Omega experts this evening, are, are there any particular plays or films that you feel accurately portray the Bloomsbury set and Omega workshop? Because as we know, there are many. Um, and I was one, we, I guess it's something I get asked that all, this a lot in tours. It's like, would I recommend certain films or um, different adaptations as being actual true representations of this group of people. Is the silence a no? Yeah, yeah I think it's a no. I can't think of anything which I think, oh yes, they've really, they've really got me there. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'd say, you know, it's better to, yeah, I mean, immerse yourself in, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Read E.M. Forster. <laughs> Read E.M. Forster. Yeah, um, read E.M. Forster or read Virginia. Or yeah. Yeah. I think that's more, yeah, more of a better way in, I think, than a lot of the, because it's, it, they, it tends to be sort of stage setty, you know, it tends to be kind of just the surface of the, mm -hmm. or the relationships between the different individuals that people focus a lot about rather than, as Grace says, the impulse to change things actually and how it's just expressed in various media, mm -hmm. art, theater, you know, it's, it's a kind of global reckoning with you know the, the 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 world that they lived in i think yeah that's something i found a lot just even from researching for the exhibition is it's the relationships that people really hold on to and that's always what's in kind of modern media that's what's latched on to and then the kind of the politics and the pacifism and the fact that they did create a new world for artists um gets forgotten in those adaptations. And I think actually sort of going back to the actual, the, the writers of the time who actually, you know, were part of this group is, is far more important and far more immersive. Mm -hmm. But obviously you can you know, still watch these things. They're still, they're still enjoyable to see. 
-hmm. but maybe it's more about yes visiting these exhibitions and, and reading you know books that you, you both of you have contributed to and written in that actually talk about the actual artwork and the objects to get a true sense of what they were trying to do um, and I think that's probably a very good place to end actually is um you know going back to the artwork and um obviously we've talked about different um, publications that people can explore and the exhibition is still on for another two weeks but if you're in London as well there is the wonderful um Bloomsbury room in the Cordold galleries that ev everybody should go and immerse themselves in because it definitely gives you that sense of Bloomsbury and Omega a touch of Omega then as well and even um, on Charleston obviously down in Sussex and um, you get a sense of that and also obviously Charleston is available for people to visit as well of this wonderful time capsule of of the Bloomsbury set but um, thank you three for um, contributing your time this evening and your knowledge. It's been wonderful just for me on a personal level at the end of this project to kind of explore it all further. And thank you everybody um, for attending this evening. And as we said, it's recorded. So please feel free to dip back in um, to anything that you want to hear again about this evening. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It's been, it's been a great pleasure to take part. And go and check out Ali's stuff in the shop. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs>